that right, in Ashfield, uh, North Carolina. And even further back at the Hadley Centre in the uh, British uh, Meteorological Office. Um, his, his involvement in IPCC uh, work, um, and particularly his, his work on the uh, surface warming hiatus, it, uh, will be, I think, the focus of uh, his remarks to us today. And uh, Peter, can I invite you to tell us what you're going to talk about? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the pause of hiatus or slowdown, how did it rise to prominence, how did it end up getting included in the IPCC fifth assessment report, what happened after the fifth assessment report, and where does the scientific knowledge on this issue fundamentally stand today? And then some take homes. So we'll start off with what is the pause hiatus? Slow down. Well, it's this thing over here. It's this short period at the end of the global temperature records that go back to 1850 when there was effectively no warming according to the fifth assessment report assessment of global mean surface temperature records. Is human nature to be drawn to the end of a time series? Okay, the latest greatest is what matters to people. And it's also human nature to extrapolate widely, wildly. So if you've gone 10 or 15 years without warming, people extrapolate that this could go on for a long time. And there's real questions as to why. People's, the recent past matters to people more than the deeper past. What does the last year or decade portend for what will happen to us in the future? How do we explain what happened in the recent past? In other words, who or what is to blame? And if you go back to the prior one, you'll see that there are, in, there are actually longer periods in the past and short periods in the past when if you'd cut the record at that point there would have been periods of a slowdown, a cessation, a hiatus, a pause as long if not longer than the one that we were all concerned about. So how did it rise to prominence? Well it's kind of natural as the period with a marked global mean surface annual temperature record without, without having a new record year, new record warm year, which is what you expect in a warming climate, is that quite frequently there will be a new record warm year. As that period lengthened and lengthened, people had legitimate questions. We know we were increasing the greenhouse gas burden, burdens through emissions of heat trapping gases from co uh, combustion of fossil fuels and other sources. And yet the temperature wasn't rising. Why? And that's a really simple narrative to give to a non-expert. It's really intuitive to a non-expert that if you're raising greenhouse gas burdens, you should expect the world to be warming and that warming should be happening in a nice regular fashion. That's, what you can, that's a narrative you can very easily spin to people who are non-expert. That's kind of the primary school or the high school narrative level on what is the hiatus. So, I mean, this is such a nice narrative to those who wish to cast doubt on climate science more generally. And there are numerous narratives that were given, but they all are a theme around something like global warming has stopped, no global warming since 1998, a slowdown in warming, all things that narratively cast doubt upon climate change. Who was doing this framing? Well, it was mainly those sceptical of the scientific consensus. There was not a lot of framing being done by the scientific community. There was a lot going on in blogs, in certain media outlets, in political think tanks. But there were some early efforts to assess in the literature, and I've brought out four papers which I will go through later on. 
So on blogs, and this is from the uh, What's Up With That blog of Anthony Watts, you would regularly get pictures like this showing a linear trend starting at a very odd date in 1997, given that this data series goes back to 1979, and saying zero trend for however long. This is a really compelling argument to the public. The earliest men media mention anyone has found is from the UK Telegraph in 2006 by Bob Carter, who is a well-known climate skeptic. And there were several more right thereafter, and it kind of grew. It was a bit like a snowball falling down a mountain, rolling down a mountain. It started off with one or two newspapers, one or two blogs. And they tended to be the newspapers and the TV channels that you would expect to perpetuate these, these kind of stories. They're written by journalists or scientists who are known to be highly sceptical of the consensus on climate change and climate science. And they grew and grew in provenance. As you roll the snowball down the mountain, the snowball grows momentum. And so eventually you even had publications such as The Economist and Nature saying this is a problem for the science community for climate science. The longer it went on, the more it was in these um, public fora, the less science had a definitive answer to the problem, the harder it became, the more interest was garnered in the media. There were also some political think tanks and NGOs who were having a say as well. Uh, and I've just taken two on each side. So there's Global Warming Policy Foundation and the Heartland Institute stressing the importance of the hiatus. And others questioning whether it ex exists at all. Greenpeace think progress. And you can see fundamentally the left-right political divide playing very strongly here. There's no two ways about it. Um, you can see how climate science has become politicised, in a sense. So what about the papers, the, the initial papers? And I've just underlined some bits from the abstracts here that are key pieces of information. So Easterling and Vena were the first to look at this in any real sense in the peer-reviewed literature. And they showed that periods of no trend or even cooling are found in the last 34 years and in the climate model simulations of both the 20th and the 21st century. So there was nothing really that they believed needed explaining. There were periods already readily available in climate model simulations. Climate models are imperfect representations of the hugely complex Earth, but they're failing having other a parallel Earths. They're the only tool we have, and they showed that those climate models can get hiatus-like behaviour, decade-plus periods of no warming. Knight et al. 2009, now caveat emptor, I was the editor of this chapter in the State of the Climate in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, but they say pretty much the same thing, that the climate models possess internal variability mechanisms capable of explaining a hiatus. And they also highlight a couple of other things, potential for data biases in the surface temperature record and the effect of other force, short-lived forcings such as solar. So the sun in the recent solar cycle has been quiet. And that means there's less radiation coming in at the top of the atmosphere than for a typical solar cycle. Foster and Ramsdorf took another approach. So they said, well, we recognize these short-lived forcings and this variability, so we'll back it out. So they removed the effects of El Nino. They tried to remove the effects of volcanoes and solar. And they came up with an estimate after removal of these short-lived effects that showed a continuation of warming. And then Sandra et al. were looking really more at detection and attribution, but they said you need at least 17 years um, for identifying human effects on global mean tropospheric temperature. Now, 
that was spun disingenuously as being 17 years with no trend is a problem. That's not actually what that paper is saying. What that paper is saying is we would need to observe the atmosphere for at least 17 years to be able to detect human influences, which is a fundamentally different problem. So anyone who spins Santa et al. in 17 years and no warming as being a problem isn't fully understanding that paper, and I was a co-author on that paper, so I do know what I'm talking about. So what happened? Why did it suddenly blow up? Well, it, this snowball had been going down this mountain, picking up more media interest, but fundamentally it was the fifth assessment report that rose the hiatus to real public prominence. So what happened? Well, I was in the fifth assessment report as an author on chapter two, the observations chapter, so I had some say in the matter. Um, we did cover the hiatus to some extent in the first order draft. So the IPCC has three public drafts or three public versions, the first order draft, a second order draft, and a final published version. There's also a zero order draft, which the public never sees. But that first order draft, we didn't really cover it in a lot of detail. It was covered in a few chapters in slightly different ways. But there really wasn't literature to assess. And if there's no literature, <coughs> there can be no assessment. The IPCC is meant to capture the totality of the scientific literature at the time. If no one's written about it, we can't assess it. The expert reviewers raised requests to consider it in more detail. They pointed at a number of papers. We made some changes to go to the second order draft, but we were really trying to keep it. It didn't seem to us scientifically to be an issue. Now, there's a difference between scientifically an issue, and we were trying to do a scientific assessment and politically and societally an issue. Now, the second order draft is when you now get the governments coming in. And we got a pretty strong three-line party whip from a large number of governments that we absolutely had to cover the hiatus. So that was from the European Union, the US, and a number of national governments, including a number of European governments who participated in the review process. Several other governments, they took the contrary view that we put too much emphasis already on the hiatus in the, second, in, in the second order draft. So even within governments, there is this dichotomy as to what should we do about the hiatus in the IPCC. So the final lead author meeting was in Hobart, in Australia. And we convened a very large cross-chapter meeting to discuss the hiatus. And when I say large, I mean basically every chapter pretty much emptied out and took part in this. It may as well have been a plenary, even though it was meant to be one or two members from every chapter. Everyone was interested in this issue. Everyone had a say in what was causing it um, and how the IPCC should handle it. But there's still no literature at this point. So there's still nothing really fundamentally to assess. We did agree to address by convening a new box. So a box is a rhetorical mechanism, if you like, of IPCC for pulling together lots of distinct strands of information from across as many chapters into a single location where you can do an in-depth assessment of that particular aspect. It allows for cross-chapter referencing and a degree of consistency across the report. So box 9.2 was drafted entirely, and I mean entirely, after that final lead author's meeting. So there were several web-based meetings of experts at weird and wonderful hours because we had authors from across every time zone. So sometimes you'd be up at 2 a.m., sometimes you'd be up in the middle of the day, and sometimes you'd be goodness knows what, it was really difficult to convene. And we basically text, drafted text with each chapter bringing its own perspective on it. 
but it was a community effort of about 15 to 20 of us uh, with expertise in observations, in forcing, in models, um, in projections, huge number of, of experts from across the spectrum of working group one. But the lack of literature meant this assessment was largely an expert judgment-based assessment. We didn't have the papers to assess fundamentally. And it's important to note that when you add something like this, this late in the process, there is no opportunity for a formal review. So this final draft doesn't get reviewed by anyone other than, if you want to, by friendly reviewers you put out to, and that's what we did for box 9.2, but it has not got the same level of rigour as some of the other bits that have been through first order draft, second order draft, through two very, very in-depth substantive reviews. Trust me, when you open an Excel spreadsheet and see a thousand review comments, peer review will never hold a theory for you again. So what did it say? It's due in roughly equal measure to a reduced trend in radiative forcing and a cooling contribution from natural internal variability, medium confidence. There is low confidence in quantifying the role of changes in radiative forcing and causing the reduced warming trend. Those are the key bits in the statement in the summary for policymakers. Why have I stressed the confidence bits? Well, in IPCC, confidence statements have a very specific meaning and it's basically a combination of the amount of evidence and the agreement of that evidence and if you're in the lower left quadrant here so in other words if your evidence poor or if your evidence disagrees substantively then you only have low or medium confidence so that's where we were we put a box out, it was the only thing that was followed up by the media when the fifth assessment report working group one was unveiled in Stockholm. The only thing of interest to the media. IPCC can't explain the warming hiatus. Climate science can't explain the warming hiatus. Well, what we actually want is peer-reviewed evidence-based science, and we wanted after peer review, and the problem was that we hadn't got the peer review basis. But IPCC recognising the hiatus as a thing, if you like, is effectively a clarion call to the global scientific community, and you can guess what happened next. Everyone dropped what they were doing, and started doing analysis on the hiatus. Um, so there are tens of papers, if not hundreds. And nature climate change for a while should have probably been named nature temperature hiatus because that was pretty much all they published. Um, and there were hundreds and hundreds of papers, uh, tens if not hundreds of papers. And these were breathlessly reported by the media. So you had one week, it's the Atlantic. You had the next week, it's Arctic sea ice. You had the next week, it's the Pacific. You had the next week, it's stratospheric water vapour. All this going on. So to some extent, we called in the climate sharpshooters. We gave them nice silver bullets. Silver bullets are nice, they're things that help us explain things, or that they, they kill, kill nasty things, like the hiatus in this case. Everybody wrote a different silver bullet and everyone's silver bullet said something different. We could explain the hiatus several times over. In fact, if the globe had started cooling at about 0.5 degrees centigrade per decade, from the combination of these papers, we could have explained that as well if we'd wanted to. But that's not sensible. So we need to do another assessment. We need to weed, weed out these papers. And in fact, just this morning, I saw an advanced talk of a of a talk that we're going to have at the sixth assessment report scoping meeting in Addis Ababa next week, and it's making much the same points I'm about to make. So what, what's the new knowledge? 
Well, firstly, on the observational basis, there are three things, all of which are new since AR5 and all of which push up the global temperature record in the most recent 15, 20 years. So the new analyses of marine records, which were not in relation to the hiatus, actually, they were driven by the need for NOAA to revisit its marine surface temperature record, had, a bi uh, had, a, had an effect on the most recent 15 years. And the effect basically relates to the fact that NOAA, which was used also by NASA, treated ships and boys as the same. Ships are not boys. And in fact, there is a systematic offset between ship and boy-based measurements of the order of 0.12 degrees centigrade with the boys reading cold. Now, if ships and boys had been forever more in a given instrumental mix, sampling a given area in a given way, it wouldn't be a problem. But since 1990, we've gone from 90% ships, 10% boys, to 90% boys, 10% ships. And where we sample has also changed. So if you don't account for the systematic bias between ships and boys, you bias the record. And that biased record, because boys read colder than ships, that without accounting for that, you diminish the rate of warming recently because you're not accounting for a known systematic effect in the instrumental record. We've also made substantial efforts through the International Surface Temperature Initiative, which I chair, to improve global holdings. So we've now gone from about 7,000 stations to 35,000 stations that we have available to make global long-term temperature records from. And they tend to sample areas that have warmed a little bit more than the old stations did. So there's more stations in the high Arctic, Canada, Siberia. There's somewhat more in a few other areas that have been warming more than where we were already sampling. And then there's another one using reanalyses, which are numerical weather prediction forecast systems, but run historically and also interpolation techniques. So this is trying to spread information from where you have an observation over a broader region. And both of those say that we underestimated the warming primarily because we weren't capturing the Arctic and some other areas that were warming faster. <coughs> there have been a whole host of papers about internal variability mechanisms. Um, primarily around ocean modes of variability. So you have the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is the one hopefully everyone in this room knows about because it's whether there's a very strong westerly flow and it's raining all the time on Ireland or whether, as in this past winter and spring, it's a negative and it's a more easterly or southerly flow which bangs out less rain on Ireland. And by the way, we are in drought by ostensible measures in Ireland, I know. Um, there's also longer term Atlantic ones, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which would have a time scale about that of the hiatus. There's the Pacific decadal oscillation and the El Nino southern oscillation, which are Pacific modes. And then there's the Indian Ocean dipole. And there are high quality analyses, all of which say and have been published in places like Nature, that that's one of those is the answer. All plausibly saying one of those is the answer. Some papers have also posited a role for sea ice reductions in the Arctic, which could cause a reorganisation of the circulation and cooling, wintertime cooling in Eurasia, which is a big fingerprint of the hiatus. But all of these have some reliance on models or, and or sparse observations of the phenomena. They cannot all be correct. If we summed those all up, we would be moving rapidly towards an ice age. So they cannot all be correct. And more recently, there have been some analyses using very large ensembles of single models. So this is an ensemble of 100 plus members 
And they show that e, it will be very difficult to apportion responsibility for an internal variability mechanism. So you can have the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Indian Ocean be in a condition that could drive a hiatus, but it is not a given that the atmospheric dynamical response will play ball with that. And so you get this issue that that you cannot, we, we will never know if it's internal variability, we will probably never know which ocean, which mode is responsible. It's just not possible. There are also other things, so there are short-lived forcings, volcanoes in particular. And a problem that we have is that we don't include in the historical climate model runs the small to medium-sized volcanoes, which isn't a problem if they go off infrequently, but over the last 15 years there have been a large number of volcanoes that are not your Pinatibos, your Krakatoas, but are still climatically potentially important. It's, it's, a, it's an order of 0.1 watts per meter squared, which doesn't sound much, but that's about comparable to a couple of years, three years increase in the greenhouse gas burden from carbon dioxide. And the high latitude volcanoes, which many of these have been, you all will remember the Iceland volcano that shut down European airspace for four or five days. These have tended to be very much underestimated in their impact because they're put it to, because the climate model forcing ancillaries don't catch the low tropopause height in the high latitudes. So they don't catch the burden of volcanic aerosols there. The net effect of the volcanoes could at most explain about half the observed slowdown or hiatus. <coughs> then there's a whole bunch of other forcings that have been posited in single papers. Um, so one thing is that there's been a, we have been incredibly successful in the Montreal Protocol um, to, re, to remove um, ozone-depleting substances which were causing the ozone hole in the stratosphere. Compare and contrast perhaps with our efforts at mitigation on climate change, it's probably because it's somewhat easier to change your refrigerant and change your hair your hairspray than it is to change your way of life, fundamentally. Um, but that it, CFCs are not just ozone depleting substances, they are also incredibly potent greenhouse gases. So the fact that we've been able to phase them out more aggressively than was hoped means that there is a reduced greenhouse gas burden compared to what we thought there would be. There's also been this quiet solar cycle on the flip side, some greenhouse gases may have increased more than thought, and in particular, the atmospheric radiative efficiency of methane has been increased a little bit, bumped up a little bit, and that wasn't reflected in the climate models. There's been quite a lot of changes in stratospheric water vapour, which isn't a forcing per se, it's a feedback, but it is very radiatively efficient, and the climate models don't get that stratospheric water vapour. And then the real wild card in, in climate science is aerosols and their effects. So we don't observe aerosols well, we don't understand aerosol lifetimes well, and we don't in understand in particular the indirect effects of aerosols on both cloud condensation nuclear density and cloud lifetime, which are huge uncertainties so the net effect of all of those is uncertain, but they certainly in part cancel each other. So there's some fortuitous cancellation and errors between what forcings actually existed in the real world and what forcings were in the climate models. But it's probably a non-zero cancellation. There is probably an error in the climate forcing that was given to the models, and if there's an error in the climate forcing that was given to the models, it would be alarming if there wasn't then an error in what the climate models showed. That would be far more alarming than if the climate models agreed with the observations because then we'd have to work out why they agreed with the observations despite the forcings being wrong. <laughs>
So if you want to understand the hiatus, you really need to have very good inventory of forcings, and we fundamentally do not have that, particularly for some of the shorter-lived, harder forcings to understand, such as aerosols. So if we were to create a new assessment today, what would, in my opinion, we say, and I think this is going to be very consistent with what I'm going to hear in Addis Ababa next week, I don't think it would be a million miles away from what was actually said in AR5. But now, instead of saying low confidence, medium confidence, we'd probably be saying high confidence or very high confidence. And we may even be using likelihood statements such as very likely or virtually certain. I would say it would give slightly more weight to the role of internal variability. Internal variability probably explains most of the hiatus. There would be a greater recognition of the role of the oceans and potentially sea ice. And there would certainly be a far more acknowledgement of the role of both spatial and instrumental biases in global mean surface temperature in the most recent 20 years. And there would be a more nuanced discussion, I think, of the multiple potential pathways and mechanisms of decadal variations in climate, and a greater recognition that 21st century climate will not be linear, even in the global mean, and sure as hell won't be locally, at the level that matters for planning. We need to plan for variability. Climate change does not negate climate variability. It acts in concert with it. Sometimes it act, they act together, in which case you may get very rapid change globally or locally, and sometimes they will act against each other, in which case you may not get much change. Or you may even get periods of cooling still in the 21st century, even under an increasing greenhouse gas burden. Now, since AR5, so we stopped, in AR5, we stopped just about there, in that last trough. Since AR5, the last three years, according to all of the estimates, have each been record warm. And 2017, as it stands, has about a 50-50 chance of exceeding even 2016. So if it was variability, Variability can act against it for a while. It's like walking a dog up a hill and the dog sees the sheep down the hill and it strains on the leash for a while and then it sees the sheep up the hill and it strains on the leash the other way. So the flip side of hiatuses, or hiati, is surges. And it may be that by the time we're actually drafting AR6, finalising the drafting of AR6, which is just three years' time, what the governments will be asking is not a damn thing about this hiatus, which is yesterday's news. They'll be worried about, is this surge going to continue? What does it mean? And rather than having the sceptical side pulling us, we'll have the alarmist side pulling us. And we're the scientists in the middle trying to make sense of this. My view is that this is probably as much variability as the other. Indeed, if you, if you put a linear trend plus some autoregressive moving average process on top, it would look like, very like this. This is the superposition of two things, of some variability with some kind of long-term memory component and a much more linear, so the dog walker walking up the hill is the forcing, and the dog is the observations. It's going all over the place because it's getting pulled by the natural variability modes in the climate system. So what's the take homes? Did a hiatus ever occur? Ever even occur? Well, statistically, no. There is no, no robust evidence that there was a change in behavior. There is no robust statistic that I could use that would show a change point in the, in the observational time series behaviour then particularly after taking into account the new observational insights in the most recent three years. But practically, yes. Your eyes don't lie that badly. Okay, fundamentally there was a period in the early 21st century in which 
global mean surface temperature changed less than it had done before and less as it turns out than it has done since. Did it matter or cast doubt on the central tenets of the science? Publicly, yes, absolutely. Scientifically, no, which is why we were so against such a high-profile inclusion in AR5, because we knew it didn't fundamentally call into question aspects of the science. Why did it occur? Mainly natural variability with some contribution from both long-lived and primarily short-lived forcings, so volcanoes, solar, some from errors in what we'd given to the models in terms of the long-lived forcings. Did any good come of it? Well, I would hope we don't forget any time soon um, that decadal scale change in variability is important and that climate change is not some linear process even at the global mean scale, that there will be periods when we have surges, there will be periods when we have hiatuses. And those matter on a policy basis and they matter on a, mitiga on a mitigation and particularly an adaptation basis. They matter hugely because you need to adapt for that variability. It's not the climate in the future is not some deterministic value we can know absolutely. We need to understand and plan for the range of possible futures which depend upon climate variability as well as the mitigation choices we make.